Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at the Creality Ender 3 S1 Pro. Now, I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but stick around and I'll break down what makes this your next 3D printer. Hi, I'm Ryan and this is This Smart House. I do smart home tips, tricks, and reviews. And yes, I consider 3D printing a critical part of anyone's kit that's into DIYing, electronics, or even smart home tech. With a good, reliable 3D printer, you can quickly run off functional prints for your home and next project. Now this might be one of Creality's most expensive Ender 3 printers, but I think you'll see that with all the features, ease of use, and time savings, it's worth it. So, let's jump in. So I've had my Ender 3 V2 for about two years at this point. I put plenty of money into it for upgrades. We'll take a look at what those upgrades are here a little bit later in the video. But first, I wanna thank geekbuying.com for sending over the S1 Pro for me to take a look at. It could not have come at a better time. Right now, I'm in between jobs, so I've got a little bit more time on my hands. So I've been helping my wife teach her gifted fourth and fifth graders about 3D printing. She definitely has some future engineers in that group. So my Ender 3 V2 has been working hard cranking out the kids' designs for a project. Actually, it's working on one right now. This is great timing because it gives me an excuse to take over this entire dining room for this video. So enough chit chat, let's take a look at the features across the Ender 3 S1 fleet and what makes this the pro version of those printers. So looking at all three versions of the Ender 3 S1 series, the standard S1, the Pro that we're looking at today, and the newly introduced Plus, they all share these common features. A direct drive extruder, a CR touch, a filament runout sensor, power loss resume, a 32-bit board, a dual Z-axis screw, a full-size SD card slot, and easy assembly. Now, if you're new or new-ish to 3D printing, let me quickly explain what each of those means. Direct drive. This means there's no Bowden tube between the extruder and the hot end. The extruder is the part that grips the filament and feeds it into the hot end, which melts the filament. Having a length of tube here introduces more potential failure points and causes issues with soft or flexible materials like TPU. With direct drive, these two are directly connected, so there's less room for error. The only real downside here is if you do get a jam, it can be harder to clear. One quick side note, you can actually swap out the print head for a laser engraver. This feature was actually available on the V2, but it seems the new version is even better. If I get my hands on one of these, I'll do a separate video on it. Love it or hate it, the CR Touch is touted as an auto bed leveler. At this price point, there really isn't such a thing as an auto bed leveler. The CR Touch will physically probe the bed and create a mesh of points. These points are used to modify the G-code to correct for small dips or changes in the build surface. I really like mine. It does make getting reliable prints much easier. It can also help when doing manual bed leveling. On my Ender 3 V2, I have the professional third-party firmware installed, and it has a really neat bed tramming wizard to help you get your bed as square as you want. If you do want to manually level your bed, which I do recommend, the S1 has a friendly but a little bit confusing five-point manual leveling menu right next to the auto level on the touchscreen. This is another nice feature that keeps you from losing a long print. The filament runout sensor detects, well, when you run out of filament. It pauses the printer and lets you add more filament and start where you left off. I did get to try this, and it actually works. It's great for when you have a little bit of filament left on a spool and you want to get rid of it. I would have liked to have had some additional options to unload or control the extruder when changing filament. I ended up having to cut the end of the old filament right above the extruder and hold the new end of filament into the extruder to make sure it actually grabbed it. Then I had to wait around to make sure there wasn't any problems. So it wasn't as convenient as it is on other printers. Similarly, the power loss recovery lets you resume the print at the exact point in which the printer lost power. Now, this mainboard is equipped with updated drivers. These electrical components drive each of the motors and can contribute to a loud printer. Actually, one of my wife's students, who also has a 3D printer at home, commented on how quiet my V2 is because both printers have the updated drivers on board. In fact, really on each printer, all you can really hear are the fans running, which consequently, they're both running right now, so you could probably hear them. Now, the reason this is important can be illustrated quickly. Plus, full-size SD cards can be cheaper and last longer. So unlike my Ender 3 V2, the S1 has dual Z screws to help keep the Z movement accurate. This will help with the quality and reliability of your prints. Most experts agree that this is unnecessary on this small of a printer, but it's still nice to have. Again, unlike my V2, the assembly on this should have taken me around 15 to 20 minutes. It comes in the box mostly assembled. You really only have to attach the print head, install the gantry, connect all the wires, and then get everything leveled. The V2 actually took me over an hour and a half to get set up. The S1 is really only about seven steps and very easy. If you do struggle with the instruction manual, they do have videos available and on the SD card. I might even make a quick assembly guide as I've already shot most of this footage. The only part that really took me too long was securing the screen. Make sure you don't tighten any of the screws between the bracket and the printer before you get all of the screws started. Oh, and this is super important. 
Please make sure you check the power supply switch on the back of the printer before plugging it in. Mine was shipped with a US plug, but was still set in 220 volt mode. They have it covered in a sticker, but I would have almost made the sticker cover the AC plug just to make sure the users check this before plugging it in. Now that we've seen all the features that Creality has added on the S1 series of printers, let's take a look at what makes this printer a pro version. Well, first thing you notice is the 4.3 inch touchscreen. This should make navigation a lot easier for those who are new to the Ender series. Any vets of older Enders will take some time to find all the features in the touchscreen UI. Now, if you're like me and enjoy updating your printer with custom features using a third-party firmware, you can do so on the S1. However, you can't modify the screen. It seems that Creality has used their own closed source for this touchscreen. So as of today, no one has released custom firmware for it. If you really need to change the firmware, you can purchase the non-touchscreen for the standard S1 and connect it to the Pro. That you can modify using custom firmware. The next upgrade is the PEI Spring Steel Magnetic Bed. I love that upgrade that I made to my V2 early on and it really helps make tricky prints even easier. The nice thing about the PEI bed is when it's hot, prints stick really well, and once they cool, they typically pop off. If they don't pop off on their own, then you can just pull the bed off, flex it, and the print comes right off. Plus, if you make a mistake and scratch up the bed, you can just pick up a new replacement on Amazon. Now, the one that comes with the Pro is textured, so the bottom of my prints with PLA have kind of a sparkle to them, especially in the black color. So if you don't like that, you can swap this out for a smooth PEI bed like the one I have on the V2. The build volume of the S1 Pro is 220 by 220 by 270 millimeters, which is just slightly larger than my V2's 220 by 220 by 250. So you have a little bit more room in the Z axis. Another feature of the Pro is the LED bar. It makes keeping an eye on your prints even easier, but it's just a basic LED bar that's controlled by a switch on the side. I really wish this was ran back to the board so you can have it turn off when your print is done. Another great update would have been RGB IC LEDs so you can have the print status shown on the LED bar. Now, if you remember way back, I upgraded my V2 with LEDs and coupled it with OctoPrint. This allows the LED bar to be functional. It shows print and printer statuses. If you want to tackle that project, I've got a whole video right up here. I plan on adding a relay to these LEDs later on so I can activate them with OctoPrint. Now, on the subject of OctoPrint, another nice upgrade on all the S1 series is USB-C instead of micro USB. I'm currently in the process of setting up another OctoPrint server for this printer using an awesome mount that I found on Thingiverse from user SupMedic. This mount actually moves your touchscreen up and towards the center of the printer. It allows you to mount your Pi 4 right under the touchscreen using all the hardware already included with the printer. And if you add a fan and a heatsink, it should stay nice and cool and out of the way. I can't wait to get this set up. Now, the major upgrade on the Pro Series would be the all-metal hot end. The hot end is where your filament is melted and extruded through the nozzle, similar to a hot glue gun. This is Creality's own designed Sprite Pro direct extruder and hot end. What this means is this hot end can go up to 300 degrees Celsius. So you can print with high temperature materials like high temp PETG, nylon, nylon X, PA, and even carbon fiber filaments. This means there isn't any consumable parts that need to be replaced like PTFE tubes inside. So this print head should be rock solid. Now one of the criticisms that I read and agree with is the design of the parts cooling fan. It's obtrusive and makes checking on those first critical few layers more difficult. You have to get down to the side to see what's going on. Plus this shades out most of the light from the LED bar. So now that we've seen all the features of this printer and the S1 series, let's see if it truly is worth the price tag. Now as I teased at the beginning of the video, this is one of Creality's most expensive on the Ender 3 series, only topped by the new Ender 3 S1 Plus. The biggest change of that model is the increased build volume to a very large 300 by 300 by 300 millimeters. So talking about the price, the S1 Pro standard price comes in at $470, which is $70 more than the basic S1. But with that, you get a ton of upgrades. According to one article that I read, those upgrades would cost you around $200 if you purchased them and added them onto the basic S1. Even my Ender 3 V2, which you can still get for around $209, would take about $223 to upgrade. Even with all of those upgrades, you still can't get all of the same features as the S1 Pro. But all in all, I think the S1 Pro is a great choice for someone who already knows they're going to be into the 3D printing world. This is great for a person who's sent off their CAD designs to be printed somewhere like PCBWay or Shapeway. Or if you have a friend that already has a 3D printer that you borrow constantly. So this would be for somebody who already loves 3D printing, but wants one that's solid, powerful, and easy to get going. The S1 series is kind of like buying a Toyota. It's not the cheapest or the flashiest car, but will run forever. Now, if you're an absolute beginner and don't even know if you want to get into 3D printing, then you might want to check out one of the less expensive versions like the original Ender 3 Pro or the Ender 3 V2. There's no sense in dropping almost $500 on a hobby you may not even want to do. But if you do end up picking up one of the more expensive versions and don't like it, it should be pretty easy to sell on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. 
especially if it's already built. Now, after I got the unit set up and trammed, I ran off the Bitcoin print it already had on the SD card, which came out quite nice. I did have to adjust the Z offset because the layer lines were a little bit too thin. Then I ran off the gold standard of 3D printing, a 3D Benchy, which came out really good, even using the inexpensive Inland PLA Plus filament that I've actually had open for over a year. The Benchy came out pretty clean with only a tiny bit of stringing on the deck. I haven't done a full dimensional analysis, but 3dbenchy.com will guide you through this if you want to test out your 3D printer. Overall, I believe the S1 series is an upgrade in every way. It removes some of the more DIY appearance of the original Ender series by replacing the aluminum extrusions with a sleek injection molded base. The printer has many small improvements that add up to a really solid device, such as the CR Touch, direct drive extruder, PEI bed, LED lights, and touchscreen. So for those of you who are looking for a reliable printer, this is a great choice. Additionally, with the extremely high temperature hot end, you can print pretty much any material you desire. So if you're debating between the S1 standard and the S1 Pro, I think that extra $80 is an easy pill to swallow when you see all the great features you get. Now, if you're interested in picking up one of these, you can find links to everything, including the accessories in the description or the attached blog post. Another big thanks to geekbuying.com for sending this printer over. I'm gonna make some really good use out of it. Now, before you go off to another video, click right here to see how to set up Octoprint and add a ton of useful features to your existing 3D printer. Thanks again, I'll see you on the next video.